and welcome to Season 5 of Teaching Matters, a podcast from the Psych Sessions Network. I'm Eric Landrum from Boise State University, one of Teaching Matters' three co-hosts. My other two co-hosts are Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University and Adiyinka Akinsealer-Smith from City College of New York. And we do say goodbye to another co-founder of this podcast, Asani Sewell, in Episode 6 of this Season 5. These 10 episodes of Season 5 were recorded from July 2022 through March of 2023 and are released on 10 consecutive Saturdays in 2023, starting on March 18th and continuing through May 20th. Oh, the places we'll go. We'll open with a current discussion of AI and chat GPT, then we'll harken back to mid-2022, where we had multiple conversations with different members of the Society for Teaching of Psychology, that's STP, and different task force leaders about their work. We'll chat about career transitions and changes, one time generically and one time specifically. As podcast co-founder Asani Sewell joins us, sadly, for the last time as a regular and discusses her departure from the podcast. In the remaining episodes, we discuss other classic topics that are, yes, beyond teaching. How do we handle students and other professionals and how they address us? We talk about the rituals of higher education and how they relate to our regular daily lives with special meaning for Eric, a discussion about the special skill of peer reviewing, and then a discussion about applying for honors and awards, why it's good for you, your department, and why you should apply as a role model, even if you think you might not receive the award. It's all part of the knowledge and skills that psychology professionals need to know about, the stuff that we are not taught in graduate school. That is beyond teaching. Welcome to season five. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Beyond Teaching. The three of us are just overjoyed to be with you here again today. I am Eric Landrum from Boise State University, and here are my colleagues. And I'm Yinka Kinchler Smith from the City College of New York, New York City. And I'm Susan Nolan from Seton Hall University in New Jersey. And Susan, I think you have a topic for us today. I do. There was an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education a couple of months back about uh, peer reviewing being the scholarly skill that no one is taught. And I thought we've talked about peer review a bit in some other contexts, not a whole lot on Beyond Teaching. And I thought I would talk about, uh, have us talk about this fact that it's not something, there's lots of things we could talk about, but focusing on the fact that you're thrown into this mix. You're peer reviewing things. You don't maybe really know initially what you're doing. There's not a whole lot of mentoring out there. So from that end, and also the end of getting peer reviews that seem kind of bananas. And you're like, this person does not know what they're doing. And I would add to that and why one would want to do a peer review, because I do think that once you get into it and you uh, have a better feel of what you're doing, you can learn a lot in terms of improving one's own uh, manuscript preparation for journal. Yeah, absolutely. And Eric, I know you said you had some layers to add as well. I do. And I think that those are good topics. But I also, before we're finished today, also want to mention that, you know, not every graduate student is going to go on and become an academic. So I actually think there's a handful of reasons why we shouldn't put so much emphasis in graduate school on peer reviewing, because that's not necessarily a transferable skill that every grad school graduate will use. So I'm actually okay with it not be wanting the, one of those core skills unless we can translate it in some way to making it transferable to the types of jobs that are uh, master's degree folks and our doctoral folks go into. But so for I, faculty, I mean, especially if one is on the tenure track route where you that is expected, uh, it's something that we need to know in terms of... Right, but I think that's a bigger... Yinka, you're correct, but I think it's a bigger issue of if we try to serve everyone in a graduate program, you know, how do we give specialized skill sets to the students who need them? I mean, Clinical and counseling faculty members certainly need a specialized skill set. 
compare to a developmental or a social student in a grad program? Mm. So I would argue that in a graduate program, that it is a transferable skill, because if you're getting a PhD for sure, you're doing that for a reason. You're learning how to do research and you're learning how to read research. And I think peer reviewing allows you to read research at a deeper level. And if you're a clinical or a counseling psychologist or whatever type of psychology you're doing, maybe you're going into industry, you are going to be reading research. And having done peer reviews makes you, I think, a better consumer of research because you know the right things to look for and the right questions to ask. But and you're even talking as, about just doctoral. You're not talking about people getting a master's degree in marriage and family therapy well, or you, a master's you, degree and a master's degree in developmental. I, I, would, I would agree with Susan and argue that, and especially this is as a clinician. You want to know what's clinically being used, what's appropriate, what isn't, uh, what the research is telling us. So it, it is a good thing in that case to have a handle on what's out there. Having a handle on what's out there is not the same thing as being able to write a peer review and being able to understand how to react to a peer review my friends. I think writing a peer review, reacting to a peer review, you're right. Maybe that's not something that our graduate students all need. But I think writing a peer review really does give you uh, insight into how research is done because you learn how to really look at what's the sample and how they find the sample? What analyses did they use? Are the conclusions that they're drawing warranted? The classic example I use when I teach my students about operationalizing variables is we're calling it aggression, but there are studies that that had, oh, how often did people get hit by a baseball from a pitcher and how much hot sauce were people get, right? These are things that we're using to operationalize aggression. So if you're reading the conclusions and it said, this is aggression, like what's a good question to ask about how do they do this work? Yeah. I mean, being able to analyze a journal article, being able to analyze a written work, I think is a good skill for actually undergraduates as well as graduate mm -hmm. students. I but I think that deeper level of analysis, if someone's submitting a journal article to a journal and you're doing a critical peer review and making at least a singular decision from a, the classic reviewer too. Reviewer two is reviewing and saying, do you believe this should be accepted with a revision? major rejection, minor rejection, that nuanced decision. Uh, if you ask me, does every doctoral student and master's student in the United States need to have that skill set? Uh, I'm not so sure they do need to have that skill set. The ones who are going to become academics? Probably so. The ones who are going to become practitioners? Do they need to have that? I don't know. I'd have to talk to them and see what they do in their day-to-day lives. I have to know more about their jobs. Would that be helpful to them? That's why I need to know more about that. Does that skill set transfer to what they do in their day-to-day -day jobs? I don't know. So, so this is anecdotal, but uh, I, for several years now, have been doing peer reviews with students, graduate master's students, honors, undergraduate honor students, and other students who've, who are undergraduates who've done research with me for a bit, with permission from editors, usually for teaching journals, but I, actual studies and what I do is I show them some examples of what peer reviews look like, again, with permission. And uh, I say, okay, you do it, just do it. And then they do it. And sometimes with an undergrad, I'll usually do two undergrads with me so they can kind of work together with a graduate student, just me. And then we come back and I write mine. I incorporate things from them that they get the credit because we tell the editor. Uh, and then they, and I'm keeping a list of who's done this because I think at some point I want to formalize it a little bit more, but inevit inevitably they tell me they will never read research the same way. Anecdotal, admittedly. Because and you're, you, a, you're a very special case and you're a very gifted educator. But, you know, this is also authentic assessment. If you're analyzing a journal article for a class, whatever, th these students, I tell them, you're doing this and you're going to be part of the review that I'm sending in. You're impacting the future of this paper. Suddenly they've got stake in it and it's an authentic assessment. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if for a minute, I mean, because we're talking about peer reviews with the assumption that everybody knows what we're talking about. Sure. Yeah. Does everybody know what we're talking? So maybe, Susan, you can just say exactly what we're talking about doing here. Yeah. And that's actually... those like like Eric is saying, who may not have thought about this or yeah. may not care. And that's an excellent point. And when I talk about peer review in my undergraduate classes, I I've got somebody made an infographic at one point that like really walks through the process. But 
I do dial it back. And what is peer review? So when we submit an, a manuscript that we've written about our research to an academic journal, it is typically sent out to two or three. It will goes to an editor and the editor or associate editors send it out to two or three peers, people who do similar research. And having been um, an associate editor, I think both of you had these roles as well. It's awfully hard to find people to peer review. <laughs> That's part of the issue. It Once became we... even harder during COVID, I think, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And people doing uh, research in certain areas, it's even harder to find. But once you find them, those people, they read the article and they give very detailed feedback on the various aspects of the article, the literature review, the methods, the analyses, the conclusions, and then they make a recommendation. Should this paper be accepted, which almost never occurs in a first, I know of one person, my colleague, Andrew Simon, I'll shout out to him at Seton Hall, once got a paper accepted. Wow. <laughs> But a good journal too. That yeah. once. That's the I next never, I never have. Never. And then there's minor revisions, Easy. major revisions, and a rejection, an outright rejection. I should add there's sometimes what's called a desk rejection when yeah. the editor or associate editor from the start says, Yeah, this is just not a good fit for this journal for uh, a number of reasons. Um, does either of you want to add anything to my definition? I, I, yeah. Inka, I think that context is really important. When I've taught undergraduate research methods, uh, I've had some students come into that class uh, thinking that journals were the same things as magazines mm -hmm. and that you can buy journals at Barnes and Noble. And so I think there's a, and they've thought. Oh, that, I thought that when I started graduate school. Hello. Right. Didn't come and, from an academic family. I had no idea. And that uh, they would ask me, so when Dr. Landrum, when you get something published in a journal, how much do you get paid? And, and so, I mean, I think, are sweat and blood. <laughs> I think there are a lot of misunderstandings. So I think it's a really good idea to set that. Also, peer reviewers don't get paid. I think we should throw that out there, too. Peer right. reviewers don't get paid. It's a most, service to the profession. Most associate and consulting editors yeah. don't get paid. Some editors get a stipend, but most of the other people involved in the process. And editor, been an editor, Eric, yes. I'm saying that whatever stipend you got wasn't even close to paying for the amount of time that you put into the journal. No, but I think everybody understands it's an honorarium. And I'm not trying to be curmudgeonly about this. I think it can be a valuable skill for people who are going to use it in their future. I'm just not convinced it has to be taught to every graduate student. And I guess I would trust, I don't have graduate students at Boise State. Maybe that's part of my issue. Uh, I guess I would trust graduate programs to figure out what their students need and to teach the skills appropriately. And the students who need it, that skill are going to pick it up somewhere. And actually, Susan, you kind of made the point. You're actually teaching some of your undergraduates before they even go to grad school. Other students who are going to need that skill are going to pick it up somewhere. If they don't get it in grad school, they'll pick it up from graduate mentors or after they graduate or when they start submitting a school of hard knocks, when they start getting rejections, they'll pick it up that way. But that's the thing. People are picking it up. And the Chronicle article was pointing out that people are picking it up. And as a result, a lot of peer review is just not that good. And so we have science that's getting out there and many, I mean, think about COVID research, for example. I mean, when a bad study falls, gets through these various cracks because it's got bad peer reviewers, that's a real problem. Who's going to teach the teachers of peer reviewing? And are there standards of peer reviewing? Well, that's, that actually raises a good point that I was thinking of. I mean, recently I've seen, and I really couldn't tell you off the top of my head which journal it was. But journals that have given specific guidelines for each section, what they're looking for, what they want, uh, as opposed to here, just send us a peer review. And then when people don't know, not only are there, not only is it for one of a better term, half-assed, but the other thing that has happened on occasion is that, that I've seen is that some people can be really mean uh, in the reviews yes. because it's anonymous. Yes. And so, you know, just try to be kind in if it's not a good article to be constructive as opposed to destructive and destroy that person's sense of themselves and so, what they can do. So you can get a couple of things. First off, there are some journals that adhere to guidelines about reviewing and publishing. And I'm not going to remember the acronym 
the, what it stands for, but COPE, C-O-P-E. I'm not going to remember what it is, but I know that a lot of APA journals decided to adhere to COPE guidelines. It's about ethics and reporting ethical ethics and uh, demographics in journal articles and about being mean, about being just nasty in journal reviews. First off, that's the job of the editor to grab that before it goes back out to reviewers. If if editor if reviewer two has been nasty in a review, the editor is not up obliged to send that out. The editor has the right to either hold that or redact. There were times early in my career reviewing for teaching of psychology, and Randy Smith was the editor at the time, and I wrote. I must have actually. I'll tell you off the air what was going on in my life that caused, but I was not as pleasant a reviewer as I should have been. And Randy wrote back to me and said, Eric, I can't send this to the author. Would you like to revise it or would you like me to hold it? I said, I will revise it. Thank you, Randy, for catching this. So the editor can do that. Secondly, there are some, there are, I can think of Frontiers in Psychology, a journal that publishes their reviewers. Yes. They're in the left the left hand column it says reviewed by so we can avoid the anonymity yeah. of negative comments in publishing the reviewer names so i had a personal experience this was way back in the day where i had submitted a manuscript and i think what had happened was and it had been given to somebody who was big in the field then to review and this person I think not, I don't know, maybe they didn't know how to figure out reply all or whatever, but had given it to a student to review. And in their comments, the student had said some mean things. And unfortunately for them, it came to me. I've actually had two different occasions where something along this has happened. And I saw it and I sat for a minute and then I sent it to them and to the editor of the journal saying, Oh, what's this? Was this for me? Shock, embarrassment, and horror. And the editor immediately took it over and said, I am so very sorry. I will handle this. Exactly and how did you know it was the student? How did you know it was a student, Yinka? Be he, because in sending the response, somehow there was a, a send all. And I don't think for whatever reason. Okay, you got cc that I was being CC'd on it. Uh, for example, and... at Boise State, student emails are you. <laughs> Boise State. No, actually, you yeah. know who that was. It wasn't you. But I was, A, I was disappointed from a personal perspective that somebody this high in the field would be so uncaring and so mean to somebody so far down at that point, the, the line. But I will say the editor took over, handled it, and ultimately the manuscript got published. But it was just, uh, I was taken aback. Yeah. So, I mean, and for me, the lesson is when I do these, again, giving people some grace and being generous in my comments. Well, yeah. can I just add, Yinka, the other tip for our listeners is that, listen to what Yinka said. She took the high road. Rather than replying and ripping the editor and the reviewers a new one, which she had every right to do, let's be honest about that. She said, oh, I'm a bit surprised by this level of comment. Was this meant for me? Did you really mean that? I mean, right. taking that high road is a class act that you can never be ashamed of, and it makes them look even worse. Yeah, and I, I will just add, I, I've had this happen in another situation where, again, that was my response, and it actually benefited me because the other person was so, by the way, the other message in this is be very careful when you hit reply all. Yes. Because you don't know who's on the other end of that train of command. Yes. So, yeah. Delayed send is your friend. I was just going to say a quick life hack. <laughs> delayed send. I have a two minute delay on my all my emails. And I can wait. What did I do? Is uh, you must not be using Gmail. Gmail, the max is 30 seconds. Oh, Outlook can give you. Yeah. Two minutes. Two, you can yeah. do whatever you want, but how much? You could do a half an hour. Wow. But, but the other ethic, thing, I, ethically, Yinka, I just want to add, it's super unethical for someone who's asked to review to, to farm it out. someone else. Yeah. 
Yeah. It can say, I don't have time to do it, editor. Do you want to invite my graduate student and I can overlook what they're doing? But that's a, very different, right? They're lying really about who's doing it. And they're abusing a student who's not getting credit for work that they're doing. Right. Susan described the right way to do it earlier, exactly. where she emails the journal, may I invite co-reviewer to join me with this. When I was editing for Scholarship of Teaching and Learning and Psychology, there was always a space on the form for reviewers to add, did you invite anyone to review with you? If so, give them credit here. There was a space where you could give credit where credit was due. Yes. Yeah. And if that's, if it's not obvious, you can do that. I will not because, you know, for confidentiality reasons, you can't just be sharing these articles. So I will explicitly ask before I yeah. give anything to a student. That's I way. also think the move with a number of journals now where it's no longer blinded in one way makes people a little more accountable for the comments that they make in their reviews. Because if you're uh, as a, if you're a budding author, it can be, you really have to develop a hard, a thick skin. Otherwise it can make one not want to yeah. submit anything for other people's review again. Well, so, yeah. Go, no, go ahead, Eric. Well, and there's one little more level of complication. Like when I review for teaching journals, um, or if, if when I submit, which I just don't submit journal articles very often, or I, even, if, even if I see other people's reviews, most of the time it's not blind. I've been around the block for so long, nothing up here and a lot of white down here. <laughs> uh, I can tell by the comments and by the style of writing. I should just add to listeners to. that Eric was saying nothing up here as he rubbed his, his head bald, bald and white down here listening. as he stroked his beard. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So, I mean, I can tell by, you know, when they give me the citations for their own work, that's not blind. Or I, they go to this and that work. Oh, I've seen them do that at a conference 42 times. I, so sometimes mm. if it's blind, it's really not blind. If you've been around the block or when you're asking experts to review work, those experts know of other experts' work. So it may not be as blind as one thinks it is in the review process per se. Susan, you were going to say something. Oh, I'm... I'm Move, I've oh. moved on from whatever thought that was. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Oh, no. I know what it was. I was going to say, what do you do when you get a review and it's clear that they didn't understand or it's bad? There's just something. What do you, how do you deal with a bad review? We've all gotten them. Assuming it's a revised and resubmit or. You mean like I've submitted something, but the review is nonsensical. The review of my work is nonsensical. It's nonsensical or they're wrong about something or they're, they're just enough, you, not like a debate, an academic debate. Like but, all three reviews or just one review out of the three? No, it's usually just one. It's rare that all three are crazy. Well, kind of depends. I mean, if they're just arguing. And it's if they're arguing with me saying all teaching in psychological science should be done by lecturers, by lecturing, and there's no other way to teach, and they're firm on that, I might as well not resubmit to that journal because it's clear that they're not going to budge. And if the comments from the editor don't even indicate that there's room for budging, then why bother? Might as well go to, I mean, so you have to kind of gauge the temperature, but honestly, that takes, it, well, I should almost speak. That took me 20 years to figure out. In year five of my career, I was butting my, heads up, my head up against a brick wall, just resubmitting because I didn't know any better. It took me 20 years to figure out the nuance. Yeah. How about you, Yanka? Well, it depends. I mean, some journals will give you feedback and then say, don't come back. And then you take that feedback if it's useful and incorporate it into the manuscript and move on to the next one. I usually have like three or four manuscript, I mean, uh, journals that I'm going to work my way down. If it's go ahead and resubmit with extensive revisions and there are two or three other, there are two or three reviewers and there's this one that stands out with something that makes no sense in comparison to the other two, I'm usually very polite in saying no and this is why I don't think this is not relevant to this paper and in my experience the editor has picked up on that and gone with that yeah how about you 
Susan. Uh, so yeah, there was one article that I co-authored with some folks in the last, let's say, five or six years, just to keep it broad, where one of the reviewers was hostile to sort of an aspect of kind of a, uh, let's say, very broadly, a sort of diversity, equity, inclusion approach. And we pushed back and uh, went through a couple of rounds and eventually, yeah, got accepted. And I've, I think I have enough papers out there that fall under that umbrella that nobody will guess. And obviously, I don't know who the person is. But yeah, it was like to address all the reviewer comments. And much of their time, much of the time, they're either really like helpful and make the paper better. Mm -hmm. Points out mm -hmm. where I'm miscommunicating because I'm not writing clearly. Right. It's like, if you don't get it, that's on me most of the time. But every once in a while, you get someone who's just wrong. They, oh, you shouldn't use this statistical analysis. And you go back through it and you're like, and you ask five people and you're like, no, that's wrong. This is absolutely the right statistical analysis. So yeah, pushing back. Politely. <laughs> yeah. Now, let yeah. me circle back. You work mostly with grad students. Is that right? I do have undergrads Both. too. Oh, yeah. yeah, but you work with a lot of students. So grad students are going to go out and become clinicians. A combination. A combination with the with sorry with the grad students in the mental health program. Most of them are going to become clinicians. Although there's some of them who want to go on to doctoral programs, and are interested in research. Our program is a clinical program. It's not a research program. But if they want to do research, they can uh, do independent research. Uh, sign up, jump on someone's research team. And obviously, you're not the only instructor that they ever see. No. Do you get a sense that someone in your graduate program is teaching them uh, peer reviewing skills? I don't. It's a great thing that Susan has raised because I don't know. I mean, possibly, I, I don't know off the top of my head that, that getting that kind of rigorous approach to this is what you do and how you do it. Yeah, probably getting some article evaluation skills. I mean, for those who are, for example, on my research team and are doing and working on manuscripts with me, we do this together when we submit and then the feedback comes back. It's like, okay, take it, look at it, and then we're going to come together and we're going to go through what the reviewers have said. But I've never thought to include them in reviewing an article the way Susan described doing it. Yeah. What's also interesting about having students involved in reviewing it is their reactions to seeing the other peer reviews, because it's, again, like another a form of authentic assessment where you're seeing like, oh, here's what I missed, or, mm -hmm. huh, we actually found this thing that the other reviewers didn't. And so it's really exciting to see what two other peer reviewers or one other peer reviewer and the editor think. So that's kind of an added. It's similar to what you're saying, Yinka, when you're looking at the reviews that come back to you, your students are getting a chance to see, oh, wow, like in the real world, this is yeah. how my work is being received. Well, it might be fun for students to see that, gosh, when faculty members write something, it's not perfect the first time and that faculty members get feedback on their work to improve it when they send it off. Gosh, just like students get feedback <laughs> on their work to improve it when they send it off to their yeah. faculty member. Yeah, I have shared, I do share with these students some, when I show them what they look like, I will show them reviews that I've gotten and they laugh. It's, it's like, because some of them are really mean and they're, they laugh because they think I, I'm mean, I but I'm wish not. <laughs> I still had some of my uh, marked up <laughs> APA papers in red ink from my undergrad days that I could show them. <laughs> me too. It took me a while to figure this out. It'll take yeah. me a while too. Yeah. So do we have any takeaways? I mean, I stand, I think we're going to have different takeaways. I stand by my belief that this should be something in graduate programs, even if they're not going to go on and be a peer reviewer, because it's more, again, I'm using the same word over and over again, but authentic to uh, be doing something that has a real world outcome. And then you get this feedback, did there editor agree with you? What did the other peer reviewers think? I think it's a really good experience. And it makes you think about, about research, the research process, and what does it mean for an article to be out in the world? We hear peer review like some stamp of approval, but when you see how mm -hmm. messy it is, I think it makes you think differently about research. It gives you permission to be critical. You, hear, you read a study in the newspaper even, and you think, I wonder, A, was this peer reviewed? And B, what got through the cracks? Yinka, your thoughts? You know, the thing that I would add to what you've already, what you've just said, Susan, is 
also appreciating the amount of work when it's done properly, the amount of work and time that goes yeah. into it. Yes. It's not, you don't just do it in five seconds and you're over and gone, but you have to read the paper carefully. You have to think critically. And then you have to respond in a way that allows the author to hear what you're saying and respond to it accordingly. Let's not forget that piece as well. Absolutely. I guess my conclusion would be I'm the only one on the screen that doesn't have a grad program in my department. So I... oh, we don't anymore either. Oh, you don't? No, we lost ours during the pandemic. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, then I'll say it this way. Not having a grad program and not speaking for other places that have grad programs, I'm a little uncomfortable saying that graduate programs should teach this skill, knowing all the other requirements they have. I think if they feel that it's important, they should. I think talented instructors like Susan and Yinka should incorporate it as they feel fit and they feel comfortable doing it. I certainly can't argue that it's a cool, authentic assessment approach, but there's lots of other important things to teach as well. Um, I think as it generalizes to other skills, that makes it more persuasive for me. And this debate, like others too, when we come up with these things in our life, always remember, this too shall pass. <laughs> Over you or through you. <laughs> Over and under. Thanks, friends. Thank you. Yep. Bye.